Okay, so this is the review for the first test in pre-calculus. So we're going to uh, do a few things. You know, the, the main things that we looked at were the domain of functions, just plain functions and composite functions. Uh, we talked about the zeros, the, uh, well, the zeros, which are the x-intercepts, and the y-intercepts of the function. We talked about linear equations and how you can define a linear equation by its slope at a point or two points. Uh, we talked about odd and even functions, how to factor an expression using completing the square or just by factoring in general, and then uh, transformations for the from the parent functions, and uh, then looking at composite functions and how to generate composite functions and how to treat the domain of the composite functions based upon the domain of the original function. So those are the main ideas we're going to do. So, you know, if we think about the, the uh, functions that we've looked at in this section, you've got some kind of line, mx plus b. So that's a line in slope-intercept form. You've got uh, y equals x squared, or f of x equals x squared. You've got f of x equals x cubed. You've got f of x equals square root of x. And you've got uh, f of x equals the absolute value of x. The one we didn't look at was the stepwise function. But those are the the basic functions that we have to deal with. So let's talk about um, x and y intercepts. So first we'll talk about x intercepts. And x intercepts are where the y value is equal to zero. So if we if we show it x intercept, we want to show some number comma zero. And to calculate the x intercepts, we set y equal to zero and then solve for x. So th the th three kind of functions that we want to concentrate on here, uh, we don't really worry about it too much with linear equation because that's kind of trivial. I mean, the x, the y-intercept would be the um, b, that's the y-intercept, and the x-intercept you would set y equal to zero and then solve for for um, the x value to make that happen. So that's trivial, so I'm not going to ask you to do that. The second kind is for uh, some kind of a quadratic equation. And it's usually not in its standard form. It's a little more complicated. So if we did something like this, and I said find the x-intercepts, you'd write the equation out, you'd set y equal to 0, and what this, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You could use the quadratic formula, you could use observation, um, grouping, or completing the square. Now, I'm going to ask you to do completing the square, but that'll be a separate problem. So all of the ones you'll have to do are basically just an exercise in factoring, and I'm not going to give you anything that's super difficult. This will just be x squared, there'll be no constant. So you know that the factors, these terms have to be x. And then you ask the question, you know, what two numbers multiplied together give me positive 3? Well, the answer would be, in this case, it's a simple one, it would be plus 3 times plus 1, or negative 3 times negative 1. Notice the middle term has negative 4, so I know they've got to be negative. So I would just write those down. You can check them, check them out by multiplying it out. Then what you do is, for this to be 0, each one of those factors has to be 0. They don't have them both at the same time, but you just need one of them to be 0. So you would solve for x as such. So 
the x-intercepts. In this case, we have two, which would be three comma zero and one comma zero. Now, the other one that we might see is something like the square root function. So we're still dealing with x-intercepts. And let's say we have the square root of um, x minus 4 minus 2. So you do the same thing. You set y equal to 0, solve for x. So you get 0 is equal to the square root of 4 minus x minus 2. If you add 2 to both sides, you'll get that. Then you square both sides, so you get 4 is equal to x minus 4. And then you solve for x, so you get x, you'd add 4 to both sides, you get x equals 8, and you can go back and check it out. So, you know, if I plug x in there, I'll get 8 minus 4, which is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. 2 minus 2 is 0, so it checks out. For square roots, you either have one x-intercept, you have zero x-intercepts. Okay. Now for the y-intercept, that's even easier. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in a page here. So the y-intercept, and I get, let's go back to this one. To finish it off. So um, the x-intercept is just going to be 8 comma 0 because y equals 0 what is the value of x so that's the that's the x intercept okay the y intercept set x equal to 0 solve for y and typically you don't have to do any kind of factoring so if I just say y is equal to 0 squared minus 4 times 0 plus 3 you get y is equal to 3. So in quadratic expressions, even cubic expressions, it's always that constant term at the end. For the square root example, so if we look at that, y-intercept, and again, I make sure I do this right. So it's going to be x equals 0, y equals 3. So we show that coordinate pair. Okay, then we have this square root thing. So we have x minus 4 minus 2. If we set x equal to 0, we have y is equal to the square root of x, or 0. 0 minus 4 minus 2. Well, the problem here is you can't take the square root of a negative number. So in this case, no, they're none, as far as the number of um, y-intercepts, there isn't. And, and the reason that's going to happen is that this function is going to look something like, um, like that. So it's going to have an x-intercept, but it starts over here. Now, if I had something that was over here and went that direction, then I would have both an x and a y-intercept. This would have a, a negative x shift and a negative y shift. So let's let's just say what, let's show you what that would look like. You'd have y equals the square root of x. The x shift is negative. So I do that, and the y shift is negative as well. So what would happen is if you stuck x equals 0, you get y is equal to the square root of 0 plus 2 minus 2, which would be the square root of 2 minus 2. So this one actually crosses, uh, actually goes that way. So if you have something minus here, you're not, if you have x minus something, there are, there are going to be no y-intercepts. If you have x plus something, then you'll have y-intercept. Okay. Okay, now um, linear equations. So 
So the first thing about linear equations is parallel lines, same slope. Perpendicular lines, negative reciprocal. Okay. <laughs> so, as I mentioned earlier, you can be given two points, or you can be given point, a single point, and a slope. Both of these, you can find the equation for the line given that information. So let's, let's look at uh, this first one, well the first one, second one really. If you're given a point and a slope, what do you do? Well, let's just give an example. 1 comma 2, so that's the point, slope equals 2. So all you have to do is use the point slope form of the linear equation. Plug in the numbers, y minus 2, so that's y, that's why I always like to write these down so I don't make the mistake, y minus 2, slope is 2, x minus x1, which is 1, and then you have to put it into the uh, slope intercept form, so that means multiplying out the right hand side, then you're going to add 2 to both sides. So if you add 2 to both sides, plus 2 here and plus 2 there, in this case it just simplifies down to y equals 2x. A lot of times you've got an extra term here, but since I just picked that out. Okay, so that's one way. Now, another thing I may do is um, you might be given a point. So I'll give you a point, say 3, comma 2 and parallel to y equals 3x minus 1. So if you see something like that, you'll say, oh, parallel have, parallel lines have the same slope. So I can, I can now know what the slope is, m equals 3. And given this point and that slope, I can use this procedure. Or if I give, give you a point, and perpendicular to some line, let's say y equals 4 thirds x minus 7. So in this case, you say, oh, the slope of this, of a line that's perpendicular here, is going to have a slope which is the negative reciprocal. So you flip the numerator and the denominator. If it's positive, make it negative. If it's negative, make it positive. So then you have a point and a slope, and you can use that procedure. Now, if you're given two points, let's just uh, pick that out. So let's say it's, uh, so I'll give you two points. So the procedure you use here is you first have to figure out the slope. The slope is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And I'm going to go ahead and label these up here. So y2 is 7 minus 3, 7 minus 3, negative 5 minus 1. That's going to be 4 divided by negative 6. So once you get to the slope, you want to make sure that Simplify, you know. Don't leave it 4, 6, or negative 4, 6. So it's going to be negative 2 thirds. So you can divide both the numerator and the denominator by 2. So that's your slope. And now you're back to the procedure before. So let's, let's go ahead and just do it. And I can choose either one of these to be x1, y1. So you, you've got your point slope form in the linear equation. Y is the variable. Y1 is the Y coordinate of one of the points. Slope is 
negative two thirds x minus the x coordinate and I want you to always put it in a slope intercept form because that's what you're going to uh, plot so two thirds times x is negative two thirds x negative two thirds times negative one is positive two thirds and then to solve for y you're going to add three to both sides so you get y is equal to negative two-thirds x plus two-thirds plus three. Then you want to combine these. So you need to find a common denominator, which in this case is three. So you convert three to, to thirds. So you take th the denominator times this whole number. Three times three is nine. So you get nine-thirds. And then once you have the common denominator, you can simplify so you'll get uh, 11 thirds. So that's the, the answer. So again, if you're given two points, calculate the slope, simplify. You know, if there's two negative signs, cancel those out. So one negative sign, just put that one out in front. Once you have the slope, use the point slope form of the linear equation, then put it in slope intercept form. Okay, completing the square. Now I'm going to give you one that actually comes out to be whole numbers. So you can check your answer. You probably do it by observation. So let me make sure I choose something here that's going to work out. I'm going to get an even number in the middle just to make life easier for you. So let's say it's... Um, Uh, plus uh, 12. Okay. So, you know, you might be able to factor this, but this way. You know, what two numbers multiplied together equal 12, but added together give you negative 8? Well, the answers would be negative 2 and negative 6. But let's say you didn't, you're not very good at factoring, so you say, okay, I don't know how to do that. So, the way completing the square works is you take the first two terms, put that third term over there, you take the coefficient in front of the x, divide by 2, square it. So that's going to be negative 8 divided by 2, which is negative 4, squared, which is 16. So you add 16 and you subtract 16. Because you know, we can only do things that don't change the expression. We can add the same thing to both sides. We can add and subtract the same thing from one side. So what that leaves is x squared minus 8x plus 16. These three terms minus 4. 12 minus 16 is minus 4. And then you take this number here. So after you finish that and before you square it, that's the term that goes in the complete square. And you can check by multiplying this out. So if I take x minus 4 times x minus 4, I'll get first is x squared. I'll get negative 4 times x, negative 4 times x. So that becomes negative 8x. And then negative 4 times negative 4 is positive 16. And then you get that. Okay, now we're trying to find a zero, so we need to set y equal to zero. So you add four to both sides. Take the square root, so it's plus or minus the square root of four is equal to x minus four. Add four to both sides, switch the sides here, you get four plus or minus the square root of four, which is or plus or minus 2. So it's going to be x is 4 plus 2, which is 6, and x is 4 minus 2, which is 2. And you can see that's what we originally guessed. Now these are the zeros. So here, you know, if we wanted to find the zeros, we'd say x minus 2 has to equal 0, or x equals 2, 
and x minus 6 equals 0, or x equals 6. So you can see the zeros that I calculate here are the same zeros. And it says factor. Oh, no, actually, it asks for zeros. So, okay. Uh, I'm not going to spell it out, um, but read this in your textbook and look in your notes. So, you know, odd functions. What are examples of odd functions? Well, y equals x cubed. Even functions are y equals x squared. Um, y equals absolute value of x. So what happens is, you know, here uh, f of x is equal to f of negative x. So if I go, it's basically symmetric around the y-axis. Whereas here, for odd functions, f of minus x is equal to negative f of x. So it's still symmetric, but instead of going this way, it's going to, it really has origin symmetry. So I'll let you read about that. Okay, so practice factoring. The next bunch is transformations, and we did a lot of these in class. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but the, you know, the functions that we need to deal with that we're going to look at are things like x squared, the ones I wrote down at the beginning, x cubed, absolute value of x, um, the square root of x. I think that's it. Now you could transform lines, but usually don't think about that too much. Um, key thing to remember is, so these are the parent functions. So the transform functions are going to look something like this. You're going to have, you're going to have a plus or minus out in front, plus or minus inside, and then you have x minus h squared plus k. So, you know, this, if you have a plus or minus, that depends, that's going to give you x-axis reflection. This plus or minus here is y-axis reflection. This is x-shift, and this is y-shift. And the same kind of things happen in these functions as well. Let me just uh, let me add a page. So, um, you know, for x cubed, you'd have plus or minus the quantity x plus or minus x, and then you'd put in parentheses minus h cubed plus k. So again, this is going to be x-axis reflection. This is going to be y-axis reflection. Now, if you if you don't have a negative in front of the x sign, you don't need to, it's just going to be plus. There's not going to be any y-axis reflection. It's just when you have um, minus x in here. So let me, let me just work one, one or two problems just to give you an idea of what to expect. I'm going to give you an equation, and I want you to plot it. So let's say f of x equals the square root of x plus 2 minus 3. So I'll ask you to do the parent function. And I'll probably give you, I'll call this something other than f, so that you can use f to be the parent function. So the parent function is just without everything, just the simplest version. And I'll give you a piece of graph paper, and I'll ask you to plot the parent function. So, you know, remember what we did. For the square root, we had 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, and then 9, 3. And you can draw a little dashed line in for your parent function. Now here you're going to look for any reflections, which I don't see because this is positive and this is positive. So there's, there's nothing to do there 
all I have to worry about is the translations. And remember, it's it's the square root of x minus h plus k. So what I've got here is plus two. So if I if I put it in this form, x minus a negative two. And the reason I did that is because the standard form has a negative sign here. So I need a negative sign to tell me whether it's in standard form. And then this value tells me which way it goes. So I'm going to shift left two units. And it's left because this is negative two. If I had x minus two, then I don't have to, it's already minus two. So and then uh, shift down three units because of I have plus k, so it's plus it's a plus and negative three. So I'm adding negative three. Negative three means down. So if I plot this, I'm going to take the starting point and go negative two this way and negative three that way, like that. I'm going to start. And then use the same movements from this beginning of the function. So I'm going to go over 1, up 1, over 4, up 2, over 9, up 3. And you know it's going to have the same shape, but it's going to be shifted. Okay. So let's uh, look at one where we have a cubic function, say. So I'm going to have negative x plus 2 cubed plus 3. So I don't have a negative sign here, so that's good. That means I'm not having any kind of um, y-axis reflection. This is just going to be an x-axis reflection. And but I am going to rewrite this as x minus a negative 2, just like I did in the previous problem. It's because I have x minus h, so I need to know what h is. So it's, it's x minus h cubed plus 3 minus sine. So what I have is I have a x-axis reflection. Um, my x shift is negative 2 or 2 to the left. And my y shift is plus 3. So to plot this thing, I'd have a piece of graph paper. I'm asking you to plot the parent function. So if I ask you what the parent function is, you're going to say y equals it's going to be equal to the is x cubed. And remember to plot the parent function for x cubed, I, I plug in 0 for x, I get 0 for y. Plug in 1 for x, I'll get 1 for y. Plug in 2 for x, I'll get 2 cubed, which is 8. So this is 8. This is 1. This is 0. And it's going to be symmetric around the origin. So this is going to be negative 8. This is going to be negative 1. So you can, again, use a dashed line to draw on your parent function. So since we're not doing any stretching or anything, you know, this is going to be flipped horizontally, flipped vertically, and shifted. So again, we've got it in a form here um, that we know what the shift is. So we got to go negative 2 units in the x direction to the left, three upward. So that's my origin. But because I have this negative sign out here, what that means, instead of going over one and up one, I'm going to go over one and down one. And I'm going to go over two and down um, nine. So you want one, two, three, three, and six. So if I go to negative six, so I'll go over 1, down 1, over 1, down 9 compared to the origin. So go over 2, over two down 9. So that will put that there. And instead of going over 1 to the left and down 1, I'm going to go over 1 to the left and up 1. 
and the other one's going to be off the chart so I can just draw this in like that and, and sketch I guess you, you know, draw a solid line here so that's that's what it's going to look like so that's what a cubic function is now the only one we haven't looked at is uh, what what have we done so far We've done square root of x okay uh, I'm still going to do the square root of x because the uh, because x squared is an even function this negative inside doesn't really do anything for us so let's say I have what did I look at here let's do the square root of um, negative x plus 4 plus 1 so we always have to get it in the form if we have a negative in front of the x we're going to factor that out and we factor that out of both terms so when you factor a negative sign out of x you get negative the quantity x and when you factor negative 1 out of 4 you get negative 4 okay so that's critical this means y-axis reflection and by putting in this form this is of the standard form x minus h so it's going to be x minus a positive 4 so what we'll have is an x shift of 4 to the right which is positive we'll have a y shift you know, it's plus k so k is 1 1 up and we'll have an x axis actually a y axis so the negative signs inside so it's going to be a y axis reflection So if I, I'll give you some graph paper. So the square root of x is parent function. We start at the origin, go over one, up one, over four, up two, over nine, up three. So that's your parent square root function. And um, you know we could write that out: zero, one, four, nine. Y is zero one two three okay so that gives us the square root function so first thing we always is we move the origin of the function so the function starts at zero zero normally here we're going to move to the right one two three four units so this is four and we're going to go up one unit so that's one unit so we start here and because we have a y-axis reflection we're going to reflect this way so instead of going to the left one up one we're going to go pardon me instead of going to the right one up one we're going to go to the left one up one we're going to the, going to the left four one two three four up one so this was at one that one's at two so this one's going to be at three and then you go um, left nine so one two three four five six seven eight nine so you'd have to go to negative five and this is two and this is three this is four so we go nine left nine four five six seven eight nine up three and so you get a function that looks like that now if this had been negative negative x minus 4 what would happen is it would go it would start here and then it would go like down that way okay the last thing so I can give you the equations and you figure out the plot or I give you the plot you can figure out the equations so that's the other one and um, then uh, composite functions So 
So this is f of x and g of x. So let's say if I give you f of x equals x cubed. Well, let's do it this way. Let's do f of x equals the square root of x. g of x equals x cubed plus 1. So first is, what are the, what's the domain of the original functions? So we looked at that. These are, these are the implied domains for square root. The argument has to be greater than or equal to 0. And that's not always x is greater than or equal to 0. It's the argument has to be greater than or equal to 0, because we can't take the square root of any negative number. So we'll, we'll do another one here in a second just to show you the difference. So that's the domain of this function. Um, the domain of this function is going to be all real numbers, and you could write out all real numbers. I'm going to show it this way because you can take any number, positive or negative, and you can cube it. Let's, um, let's just add one more thing. So let's say f of x was the square root of x plus 2. So to figure out the domain, x plus 2 would have to be greater than or equal to 0, or x has to be greater than or equal to negative 2. So you yeah, subtract 2 from both sides. So that's how it would be different. Okay, let's go back to the original one. Don't worry about that. Okay, so those are the, the, the domains. So then um, I want you to do, I'll have you do f of g of x and g of f of x. So... Remember what we do is for f of g of x, we take the function f of x and we put a parenthesis where x is. And we plug that in there. So we get x cubed plus 1. Whereas g of f of x, we take the second function, put a parenthesis and put a cubed on that, and then we put a square root in there. So that's so that's g of f of x, and this is f of g of x. Now, as far as the domain is concerned, you look at the domain after you do the initial um, substitution, before you simplify anything, if you, if you can simplify it. In this case, there's really not much we can do to simplify this. But what you can see is that the argument of the square root has to be greater than or equal to 0. So what does that mean? Well, it means x cubed has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. So if we subtract 1 from both sides like that, if you take the cube root, you'll get that x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. And you can kind of see what's happening. If, if I have a negative number more negative than negative 1, this number, this negative number is going to be greater than positive 1. So you'll get a negative argument. If x is positive, then it'll be positive and no problems. If x was, say, negative 0.5, negative 0.5 cubed would be less in magnitude than 1, and so you'd still end up with a... a um, positive argument. Now over here, you have to look at it and say, this cube has no impact on it. What, what happens here is x has to be greater than or equal to 0, because I can't take, the, can't take the cube root or the square root of a negative number. So that's, so the key thing here is to look at the domain of the composite function before you simplify it. You know, this last one, it, I could possibly simplify that, this g of f of x, I could simplify that as x to the 3 halves power plus 1, um, or I could do the uh, square root of x cubed. In this case, you, you still come up with the same conclusion, but there are cases where if you simplified something um, you might not get the same domain. Let me just give you an example of that. You know, let's say f of x equals the square root of x and 
g of x equals x squared. So if I do g of f of x, I'll take x, which I'm going to show by parentheses, squared, but I substitute in the square root of x. Now with that, that I could simplify. The square root of x squared is x. So if I, if I looked at the domain associated with this, the simplified version, I'd say it's all real numbers. But if I look at this, I'd, have, I'd say x has to be greater than or equal to 0 because I evaluate this thing before I square it. So if I put a negative number in, I'd, I'd say I can't take the square root of a negative number, and I can't do it. So that's the big difference. In this case, there is a difference between when I look at the domain. And the domain is always before, so evaluate domain of composite functions before any simplifications. Okay, so that's pretty much it. A lot of emphasis on factoring lines, transformations. And I've made up the test, and it's about 15 minutes long for me. So I usually figure four times what it takes me. 75% of the people will be done. Some people will still need more time than that. So you're going to have the full hour and 15 minutes to complete this test, um, whether it's in class or in the testing center.